everyone. Welcome. My name is Julie Clay from the University of Glasgow, and we're just waiting for one or two folk to pop into our Zoom room. And the meeting tonight will be chaired by Marion Pallister. Uh, and I'll hand over to Marion now. Hello, I was hoping that Emily would give us a little bit of housekeeping first. Would that be possible? Oh, yes. Let's get that uh, nice and out of the way. So, hello, everyone. Just a couple of housekeeping rules, same as before, but if you haven't joined us before, um, very, very simple standard Zoom etiquette. But if you've not been using Zoom during the pandemic, lucky you. So usual things are please keep your mics off. This just reduces background noise and it means that we'll keep the audio nice and clear for the recording and also for each other whilst we're speaking now. Also, if you don't want to end up in the final recording or have your image uh, in any of the recordings present, that will just be going to my cloud. Um, please keep your video off for the duration of the recording. Um, that will just ensure that you're not um, ending up in any sort of copy of this. Um, what else? Oh, yes. Questions. If you have any questions, and we really encourage you to have questions, please put them in the chat. And just whenever they pop into your mind, you don't need to wait until the end. They can go in the chat and then we will wait until the end to um, have the bit of the discussion panel then rather than interrupting the flow of the speakers uh, as we go. So I think that's all from me. Carry on, everyone. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, that's th that's the, the housekeeping out of the way. And uh, if I could introduce myself, um, I'm going to say good evening, but that's just simply because it's pitch black outside here in Scotland. Um, it's clearly not that in some places where we're coming from today, but um, I'm Marion Pallister. I'm chair of Pax Christie Scotland. And I'd like to welcome you all to this online event under the banner headline, Catholics and COP26. This joint project with Glasgow University's Theology and Religious Studies Department intends to raise issues that concern us all about the effects of the climate emergency. And uh, I hope you'll agree that it's turning, those of you certainly who've been with us um, already, um, I hope that you'll agree that it's turning into something very memorable. And we've still got events to go, uh, each one tackling different aspects of the effects of climate change, and each, like this evening, with a fascinating panel of speakers. May I take this opportunity to thank Julie uh, from the department for all her hard work in putting the events together. She'll tell us more later. And Emily, who you've also met already, who has created materials for the events and is pulling all the technical strings this evening. And I can tell you that some of those strings got a bit tangled earlier. So we just put our hearts out to Emily because we all know the stress that that can cause. So thanks, Emily, for all that you're doing. May I also thank our speakers for this evening and all you who've joined us. Pax Christi is an international Catholic peace movement and Pax Christi Scotland is deeply concerned that the climate emergency is affecting those areas of the world which have least contributed to it. Wearing another hat, I have particular concerns for the African continent, having founded a charity that supports the education of vulnerable children in Zambia. And I've seen firsthand the damage that climate change is causing. Our speakers for this event bring us their perspective from Sierra Leone, Kenya and Zambia. And I'm sure that you'll have questions to raise with them. And as Emily said, if you can put those in the chat box uh, for our Q&A session after we've heard all three speak. So 
Please write them down while you remember. And this series, as I've said, is, is called Catholics and COP26. So I would first ask Hugh Foy, Executive Committee Member of Pax Christi Scotland, to bring us all together in prayer. Hugh. Good evening. I'm delighted to join you this evening. On reflecting on our theme, my thoughts were taken to an important part of Catholic social teaching, subsidiarity. Recognition of human interrelatedness and interdependence are crucial to finding global solutions to climate catastrophe and our obligations to make the world a single family, in the words of St Guido Maria Conforte, stretch across space and time. They tie us to the victims of economic oppression, both here and across the globe, as well as to future generations. The responsibility encapsulated in solidarity is closely linked to subsidiarity, the preeminent Catholic understanding and organising principle of decision-making. Explicitly taught by Pope Pius XI in Quadragesimo Anno, it had its roots in the thought of St Thomas Aquinas and moves through the development of Catholic social teaching as a foundational dynamic. Subsidiarity proposes that decisions should be made by those most directly affected by them, or in institutional language, a central authority should have a subsidiary function performing only those tasks which cannot be performed more effectively at a more immediate local level. Our vision today is that local organisations, peoples and communities need to lead the biodiversity, climate and poverty crises. Countries in the global south, historically ravaged by systemic economic inequality, require a shift in power that allows them to decolonize the climate crisis. In our own context of Europe with North America, our collective global footprint, as many will know, is a hundred times greater than the collective footprint of the world's economically impoverished nations. We cannot solve the problem with the same tools and the same mindset and systemic power relationships that created the problem. We must amplify the voices of and shift power and decision making to those in the global south. The current asymmetrical power relationships, both in efficacy and ethics, are redundant and deny the capacity of those most impacted upon to have the agency that is the right to identify and implement solutions. Climate change impacts everything from geopolitics to economics of migration. It's responded to by mitigation and adaptation, but that burden falls unfairly on the global south in a rigged political and economic system that ignores principle and possibilities of subsidiarity. So as we pause for prayer, as we recognise the power and principalities we face and are confronted by, thus we turn to God, creator and sustainer of all, even in the midst of crises. Almighty God, you have created us in your own image. Grant us the grace to fearlessly contend with evil and to challenge all forms of oppression, that we might use the power of our freedom in the creation and maintenance of justice in and among all nations. Empower the voiceless with your grace that they may reclaim the vision and authority to shape and protect their communities in speaking truth to power. And give us all the hearts and minds of peacemakers as we seek to protect and restore all of creation, as stewards and as brothers and sisters, 
who are made in your image, called to make the world a single human family. Amen. 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 Um, thank you so much, Hugh, for that reflection and prayer, which leads us very appropriately, very appropriately, to listen to Father Charles Chalufius, uh, who is a Jesuit and, and the director of the Justice and Ecology Office of the Jesuit Conference of Africa and Madagascar, and coordinator of Africa Task Force of the Vatican COVID-19 Commission. The Jesuit Conference of Africa and Madagascar Justice and Ecology Office works to foster and coordinate the Jesuits' work in economic, social, migration, gender and climate justice in Africa. That ecology office is a, a vital Jesuit interface between global policies in the economic, social and environmental spheres and local issues confronting populations in Africa. It also works to foster collaboration among apostolic sectors in what concerns justice and ecology. I've known Father Charlie for many years, so it's with great pleasure that I ask him to set the scene for this event's African focus with his presentation entitled COVID-19, Climate Change and Poverty, a toxic mix for girls in East and Southern Africa. Father Charlie. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marian, for words of introduction. And thank you, Father Hugh, for that very profound reflection also. And I think it's a good place also to begin, um, you know, the whole issue of subsidiarity. And that's why the Pope, when he made the task force for COVID-19 commission, he emphasized that uh, local communities be heard and that's some of the work that we do is to bring the issues uh, that we are facing, you know, uh, first of all, share them among us and look for solutions, but also um, where we can, we are the ones to provide suggestions in regard to how some of those issues could be resolved. I think that that's, that's very important. Um, and I like also, Maren, you began, you know, making reference to um, to peace. Huh? As Pope Frank, Pope Post once said, "There's no if you want justice, if you want peace, ensure that there is uh, uh, justice." So the two go together. Uh, we can't have peace unless we we have um, justice. Um, so you can see my screen now. So um, those are very grim pictures, I'm sorry, but that's just the way things are in many places. Um, look at that little girl and that woman trying to make uh, ends meet and a very difficult uh, uh, circumstances. So now these are already pre-existing problems because of the way we run our societies where one group of people is disadvantaged but now these problems have been made more glaring, but even exacerbated by COVID-19. That's why I call it a toxic mix for women and girls um, in Africa. Just to very quickly set a scene, set a scene. What percentage of Africa's almost 500 million people living in extreme poverty Poverty are women and girls? Answer, almost 60. What percentage of the world's wo working hours are, marked, are worked by women? Answer, 66%. That's the world. So if you talk for Africa, it's even worse. It will be something like 70 or 80%. What percentage of property worldwide is owned by women? Answer, A, B, C, D, A, 1%. What percentage of parliamentary seats worldwide are held by, by women? 
answer B, 17%. So like I said, for Africa, it will, the, the figure will even be much more green. What percent of the illiterate adults are men? Answer, 25% D, um, compared to 75% women who are illiterate. And like I said, that's a global figure. For Africa, it may even go to 80. What percentage of women worldwide are homeless or live in adequate dwellings, such as slums? Answer, 33%. And you'll see why. Uh, yeah. And research has found that natural disasters on average, kill more women than men, yeah? At an earlier age than men, okay? So now, very quickly, just to go to some of the gendered realities for women and girls in Africa. They meet 90% of household water and fuel needs in Africa, 90%. Um, and they spend up to eight hours, depending on where you are, in search of water. They are the ones who work in forestry, fisheries, in agriculture. And in Africa, in fact, it's 80% um, uh, uh, production comes from women, uh, compared to 60% in Asia or 40% in Latin America. That's huge. Now. This is, all of these areas I mentioned, forests, agriculture, and natural resource-based, they are the sectors highly exposed to the risks that come with drought and floods. And that's why it matters a lot for Africa, because this, when we face climate change and we have 80 or 90% of labor based on this, and almost all of those are women, uh, you, you see what kind of crisis they face, uh, the fragility um, of life. So which means that when there's floods or when there's too much rain or too much sun, the forests, the fisheries and agriculture won't survive. Put simply, there'll be no food on the table for families. Another way to look at is to look um, at access to energy. Yeah. Uh, in Africa, a total of 580 million people have no access to electricity. Actually, that's, there's been a marked improvement. It used to be something like 700 million, that there is an improvement. But like I said, the, the group that ensures that there's energy resources, it's women. So it's women who have to respond, women and girls who have to respond to that gap of, of energy poverty. Um, yeah, like, like I said, the burden is, is, is on women. Yeah. Um, and women, as I said, are more susceptible to the impacts of climate, like I've mentioned. Um, they are the ones who have to respond when they are declining water supplies, climate variability, natural disasters, and all manner of things. Um, so they face a lot of uh, vulnerability. And here is, you know, what the whole, in general, picture in rural Africa looks like, in summary. Women are in a subordinate position. Um, there's deep, very deep gender inequality. And I mentioned rural areas because most of the population in Africa is in rural areas. And that's where the vulnerability is exacerbated or high. Um, they work, but their labor is not counted. Uh, they don't make decisions, uh, like I showed, about finance, about investment, about land, they just dig it, use it. But they are not the ones who make decisions about who gets land and for what. Even the crops to plant, they're just told. They don't have any voice on policy um, or government positions. And yet they have less education, 
they have less access to credit, to land, and power. So we're talking about a group very, very deeply um, um, very deeply um, uh, vulnerable, very vulnerable. So this is, I mean, I don't know how you can describe vulnerability other than, other than this. Um, so now all of this, like I've mentioned, has been exacerbated by COVID-19, uh, where we have seen increased violence against women, increased domestic violence, healthcare workers, uh, predominantly women. Uh, women's health has been affected uh, or worsened by COVID-19 in Africa. And they are the ones to suffer the economic shocks. And like I said, they also work and paid work. And Africa has been hit not only by the health impact of COVID, but also by the social economic impacts. And again, it's the women and girls who have to respond to those uh, crises. Um, the situation has been worsened for girls as well, especially for those in conflict and those uh, migrant girls. Just some of the uh, statistics, uh, up to 29 million Africans, 20, 30 to 40 million, um, are expected to be pushed below the extreme poverty line of 1.90 per day, owing to the impact of COVID. And again, I begin with poverty because um, it's this same poverty that is borne by women and that, that, that they are the ones who feel it the most and experience it the most and carry it the most. So if we talk about 29 more Africa, million more Africans uh, falling into poverty, it's worse for women. Um, before COVID, we had maybe 477 million Africans who were below the poverty line. But it means that with that increase, the number will go to slightly over 500 million out of a population of 1.2 billion. So we're talking about half or slightly more than half. And if you consider those, uh, the, the different poverty lines below uh, $5, it's higher, it's 87%. Those who have uh, be, uh, three, who are below three dollars, it's seventy-one percent. So the num the figures are quite high, and you can see the the, the change in 2020, 2019, 2020, uh, the figures going uh, up even higher. Violence increased, yeah. Um, in Ethiopia, within the space of less than two months, data from few hospitals in Atsababa show that more than 100 girls. Uh, oh dear, we seem to have a technical problem there. If you can just have, just have patience with us for just a minute and we'll see if, if he can get back in again. I think those figures of, of violence against women are horrific and we've seen that they happen all around the world. They've happened... Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere as well, but during COVID, they went up hugely. Sorry, we lost you, Father Charles. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. It's okay, it happens to us all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was talking about the increase in gender violence and uh, millions it globally will be out of school, but it's projected that... Uh, in Africa, that number can even go to uh, over 5 million uh, or more secondary school age girls will be out of school after COVID-19 crisis has passed. Um, uh, let me just show you this picture, just this picture uh, uh, of this girl. Yeah, you can see the picture. Early marriage, you know, um, and there's this quotation we got from Mozambique. Things have become very uncomfortable for me since the state of emergency began. Being at home all day with my family is dreadful because they are rushing me to get married. You know, because the girls were not in school and hunger was increasing. 
So families were giving the girls for marriage so that that could be a source of, um, of, of, of income. Uh, so early marriages and other cultural practices that have en en endangered the girls. 56% of the urban population in sub-Saharan Africa is concentrated in overcrowded and poorly serviced slum dwellings. Yeah, with no access to basic hand washing facilities raising serious concerns for uh, protection concerns uh, for girls. So um, things haven't really um, worked out for, for the girls and the situation has been um, um, uh, worsened. But as we learn from the Bible, male and female, he created them. But clearly, some are suffering more than others and some are looking like they are less human. Some are looking like it's not male and female he created them. There's, there's a problem. Um, so what should we do? Um, there's various things, but what we are trying to stress, to put a emphasis on, is to reduce vulnerability for girls. There are various systemic things that we can talk about, but I wanted to focus on reduction of vulnerability. And where we're putting emphasis ourselves is to see how we can ensure that girls remain in school and that the type of education that they get uh, is also good, one that empowers them. Um, so what we have come up with, we've come up with a, a, a program um, in Zambia, Malawi, I know Zambia, Uganda, and Kenya, it's a pilot project, but we hope to escalate it to other parts of Africa. Uh, the Jesuits, who are very uh, strong in education in Africa, just like in Europe, uh, have come to, have made a partnership with uh, Catholic sister conferences in these countries, and we have formed what we are calling the Bakita Partnership for Education which is an independently governed partnership for the Jesuit Justice and Ecology Network, ourselves, and the Association of Catholic Sisters in Kenya, Uganda, Zambia. Um, so in the wake of COVID, we want to see how we could respond and do work in Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, where the religious sisters in partnership with the Jesuits will advocate for 100% retention and improved access to quality education for girls in the targeted countries. So we will intervene by providing the education in selected schools, 10 in each country, um, but we also work with sisters, especially to empower sisters to do advocacy because they have a lot of knowledge on the ground. So we want to work with them so that they are strong advocates, both at the country level, as well as at the international level, to speak for girls so that we do not just um, give charity, but we also ensure that there's justice. And that's how we're going to have peace. So the overall objective of the Bakita Partnership is to ensure that every girl, child receives quality basic education, prioritizing the poorest and the most vulnerable in these um, countries. And through the partnership, the sisters and the Jesuits who leverage their long experience in education to advocate for better pathways for holistic education and, uh, and formation. We also be asking ourselves, what's the best way to form girls uh, in a context uh, like this? So it's, we'll also be asking ourselves questions as much as we'll be doing advocacy, we'll also be doing advocacy among ourselves to see how we can educate uh, uh, in, in the best of ways. I'd like to end by just speaking about very briefly about Bakita, uh, the, 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 the name after which our partnership is named. St. Joseph in Bakita is an African saint whose initial suffering represents that of many girls in Africa and what they are going through today. Her story of liberation gives hope to many girls in Africa who aspire for freedom, both external and interior. St. Josephine, affectionately known as Bakita, was born in southern Sudan, regional Darfur, 
She was kidnapped as a child and sold into slavery, eventually working in Italy as a nanny for a wealthy family. It was during this time that she was introduced to formal religion and came to know the Daughters of Charity of Canossa or the Canossian Sisters. Her freedom was restored out of, out of her own free choice. She entered the Sisters of Canossia Convent in Schio, Italy. And she brings hope that uh, should empower and inspire girls in Africa. And that's what we want to, to promote and to, to give to the girls. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, you've raised some vital issues that perhaps we don't even imagine here at the Global North. Um, thank you for those insights. Um, and I'm sorry that you had a, a technical hitch there. So now I would like to introduce Bernard Ndaka, Kenyan climate activist and CEO of Green Economy Foundation, which promotes tree planting. Bernard has been a youth environmental leader since 2015, and his foundation advocates for proper environment, environmental management and conservation by planting trees for a range of milestones in everyday lives trees for birthdays, trees for peace. You can see that this appeals to Pax Christi Scotland, graduation trees, uh, wedding trees, trees for academic excellence, which surely must um, appeal to, to Julie. So as he says, in summary, trees for all occasions. Bernard will now explain his project in a presentation entitled Tree Planting Activism in Kenya. Bernard, can you can you tell us all about that, please? Okay, thank you. So my name is Bernard Kiyokondaka. I was born on 18 October 1993. I'm 28 years old. I started community empowerment programs in the year 2013. And um, in the year 2015, it's when I started the environmental initiative. Since 2013, I have served as several groups like Mabara Youth Sports Association and St. John Ambulance Kenya. In the year 2020, it's when I founded Green Economy Foundation of Kenya. Our vision as Green Economy Foundation of Kenya is to be the leading environmental advocates, management and conservation leaders. Our mission is to be the leading foundation in empowering and working with the community in fostering economic growth and development. Our tree planting initiative. We began tree planting to assist our Kenyan government to achieve 10% tree cover and as we we started this initiative it was not easy to convince our community to adopt the environmental idea so what we did we looked around and found what most people loved and we saw that most young people were interested in sports like football so, we decided to use football as a tool to pull them, to bring them closer so that we may teach them what they may be having little knowledge about. That's why we started Football for Nature. So, we, we, we approached young boys within our community, then we, we started coaching them football and later on, we assisted them to learn things to do with the environment. And then we adopted the idea of for every goal that is scored in the matches that they play, we plant a tree. We went ahead and we started planting trees for peace, trees for birthdays, wedding trees. For example, when, when most of some of our friends are having weddings, I personally, I used to tell them, 
we have to plant trees. So it has been a great journey since when we began. So in Kenya, we have uh, a few groups like uh, Kenya Environmental Action Network. It is a national group that is uh, it, that comprises of other organizations, but we have representatives from different regions of this country. So the Kenya Environmental Action Network comprises of um, like 200 organizations, of which Green Economy Foundation of Kenya is a member. We also have Kenyan Youth Biodiversity Network, which also deals with the environmental conservation and management in Kenya. And Green Economy Foundation of Kenya is also a member. So what I can say is that Kenyan young people has woken up to tackle the issue of climate change, and we have we have movements that are working to make sure that our country and the African continent is green. So some people ask, why should we plant trees? And one reason is the because of global warming, the temperatures are rising. The last UN report indicated that the temperature is almost eating 2.7 degrees Celsius. So this is a concern to human survival. The only temperature that man can survive and thrive well is 1.5 degrees Celsius. So if the temperature is a concern, not a tree. Another thing, uh, we have a water scarcity. The world population is not able to be uh, uh, um, is not is not able to to use the the water that is available. As in, there is water scarcity for the global population, and we really know that trees assist in hydrological cycle, water circulation from the from the water table to their surface, to the atmosphere, then it condenses and it rains. So trees are very key in hydrological cycle. So for us to have enough water in the, in the globe, we have to plant trees. So if water scarcity is a concern, plant a tree. Another thing is uh, food insecurity. Uh, Madhya's theory of population explains um, how population is increasing while food production is decreasing. How will human beings survive when the number is increasing and food production is decreasing? This means we will not have food to consume. And this is a risk to human survival. Uh, another thing is uh, the future generation. Everyone is, is, is happy to have uh, Gener uh, grandchildren, generations to come, but where do we want them to live? Why are we not uh, making a, a place for them to live? So if you are busy making a family, having children, you, sh you should as well make a place for the generations to come. Um, another thing is uh, taking care of nature is uh, God's commandment to human beings. Because when, man, when God created man, one of the commandments that man was get, given is to take care of nature. So when we plant trees and when we take care of nature, we live God's purpose. So it is God's will that we take care of nature. And because God commanded us to do it, we have no option rather than doing it. It is God's will. Uh, would I, uh, would, am I allowed to talk a little bit about uh, the COP26? Yeah, surely. Okay. Uh, when you go back, um, when you look at the COP, it is now 26 years when uh, global leaders are meeting. 
and there have been talks and negotiations every year from the past year up to date, 26 years down the line. Global leaders have been making promises, but are they fulfilling these promises? Why are they making promises that are not legally binding? Like the, the, the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement, one of the, one of the goals of Paris Agreement was to reduce emissions, adopt and build resilience, and mobilize finances. So how comes global leaders are saying they want to reduce emissions and they are still uh, supporting fossil fuels? There is a contradiction there. They should be very clear. If they are tackling climate change, they should not support fossil fuels. And if they are not of the idea of uh, tackling climate change, let them decide. We are not tackling climate change. We are supporting fossil fuels. Though, so we need clarity on the decisions that global leaders are making. Uh, when we talk of uh, mobilization of finances, there is, there is a gap in terms of uh, climate finance. Global leaders are uh, promised uh, developing countries that they are going to finance them. But which strategy, which channels, which ways are they put in place to make sure that climate finance reaches to African uh, countries, reaches to uh, organizations at grassroots. Let them not talk in the, in the meetings. They say what they are planning to do. They give uh, plans that they have, but people at the local uh, levels, at the grassroots, are not uh, feeling the impact. According to my experience, Africa, African young people are rising to tackle climate change, but for sure there is no finances to tackle climate change. There is no uh, proper channels to, to channel the finances to the local uh, people. And for sure, ideas are there, concepts are there, but we need uh, we need Lead those leaders to work with us. Whatever promises they make, they make sure they fulfill. If it is giving uh, the de developing countries finances to tackle climate change, let them do it in reality, but not in words. Uh, okay. Again, uh, when tackling climate change, global leaders are telling us to, to tackle climate change, but they are not uh, putting measures in place to build peace. For us to tackle climate change, we must have peace. Because you don't tell your people to plant trees, to, 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 to use renewable sources of energy, to adopt uh, better ways of tackling climate change, and the same people are in war. The same people are fighting. So for us to tackle climate change, we must address the issue of peace. And again, climate change, peace, and poverty all go hand in hand. Because uh, tackling climate change is a transition. But uh, the poor population cannot shift once from maybe using uh, things like firewood or uh, non -renewable, renewable sources of energy to renewable, and they are still facing uh, poverty. How will they manage to use things like gas or um, maybe solar? So for us to tackle climate change, we must address poverty. So according to my feelings that uh, Global uh, issues of climate change in the global south, the global south 
is minimal because global leaders are not uh, responsible to what uh, promises they make to the African to the African continent. Okay, another thing is uh, let global leaders uh, put in place legally binding uh, treaties. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I, I hope that at the end of this conference there will be some legally binding treaties. And I think that what you've said there echoes so much what we heard yesterday at, at a mass where we um, the, the, the homily um, spoke of what you have explained in, in such great detail. And um, we really do need to work on, on all that you've said. So thank you so much. Um, we know that planting trees isn't the only answer, and you've, you've explained that too. Um, but we know how valuable your own project is, and we hope that people will take on board all that you've explained and, and take uh, African um, people forward with this. I'd now like to introduce our final speaker, Father Robert Sowa, a priest of the Catholic Diocese of Bo, currently working with the Siberian missions, uh, missionaries in Glasgow and carrying out doctoral research at the University of Glasgow on Laudato Sea. Robert, Father Robert was born and raised in Sierra Leone, West Africa. As a child, he experienced the long-term structural violence, which eventually led to the outbreak of a decade-long brutal civil war in his home country. He witnessed firsthand how human interests can harm the lives of poor people and harm the environment, just what we've been hearing from Father Charlie and from Bernard. His theological interests evolved from those early experiences. Father Robert was ordained in Sierra Leone and spent some time working in his diocese as a pastor and school teacher before heading for Rome, where he studied for some time. And I feel the, um, the strong link, a strong link with Father Robert as the Severians are uh, chaplains of Pax Christi Scotland and Father Robert is currently working with the Severian missionaries in Glasgow and carrying out doctoral research at the University of Glasgow. Father Robert, would you now help us to explore the impact of climate change crisis on the poor in Sierra Leone, why the local church should care? That's quite some title. Father Robert. Good evening, everyone. By way of a biographic introduction, I was born and raised in Sierra Leone, a small country on the west coast of Africa with beautiful, breathtaking landscape, mountain ranges, deep valleys, and beautiful coastal areas. Both my paternal and maternal grandparents were subsistent farmers. And when my father retired from work as a teacher, my parents were also engaged in rice farming. As, a, as children, we were regularly taken to our ancestral village for Christmas and Easter breaks, and during the long vacation, what we know here as summer holidays. During those visits, we had those rural farmers who were mostly uneducated by Western standard, forecast seasonal weather conditions with near accuracy. Back then, we used to have two distinct seasons, the dry season from November to April and the rainy season from May to October, interspersed by the annual Hamatan season, a kind of cold weather, a kind of winter, our own winter, mostly when you have the people from the diaspora coming to Sierra Leone. However, in the last 20 to 25 years, Sierra Leone has been experiencing more frequent dry spells and changing rainfall patterns, which have severely disrupted the farming calendar. With a heightened awareness in our time from credible scientific consensus, it is now evident that such severe climatic alteration 
as experienced in Sierra Leone and globally is as a result of human activities. It has become increasingly clear that the global climatic alteration disproportionately affect developing countries like Sierra Leone. In this brief presentation, I will discuss the impact of the climate change crisis on the poor and why the local church, and local church here I mean the local Catholic church in Sierra Leone should care. Poverty as defined by the United Nations is a human condition characterized by sustained or chronic deprivation of resources, capabilities, choices, security, power, necessary for the enjoyment of an adequate standard of living and other civic, cultural, economic, political, and social rights. By this definition, Sierra Leone is considered as one of the poorest countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and the world. The reality of poverty is even grimmer in the rural areas of the country, where the majority of the country's population largely depend on subsistent agriculture. As a newly ordained priest, I was assigned to St. Columba's Parish, a rural town in the southern province of Sierra Leone. My ministry in Moyamba and its environs brought me close to the harsh and dehumanizing poverty of our people. Remember, prior to this, I was in the seminary where I was assured of three calls me per day. And then I went to this rural environment. I saw our people, not that they are lazy. They work very hard. They wake up early in the morning to go to their farms, but they struggle to survive. The challenge of poverty is being further compounded by the climate change crisis and its related environmental problems, such as the increase in dry spells I spoke about and not hot temperatures, a drought, flooding, coastal erosion, and loss of biodiversity. Although Sierra Leone and the wider African continent has not contributed greatly to the climate change crisis, the country is one of the areas in the world suffering from the severe impact of the crisis. As indicated in the Sierra Leone National Adaptation Program for Action Report, the country is ranked as the third most vulnerable to climate change in the world and is one of the countries in the world with the least capacity to respond or adapt to climate change. In a country where economic, social and political system, people depend for safety and income are severely weak, the impact of climate change is already adversely affecting the poor who constitute the greater majority of the country's population. Its effects are particularly evident in the agro-based communities such as Moyamba. It affects are such as Moyamba. Another major factor for Sierra Leone's environmental instability is a rich deposit of mineral resources, iron ore, diamond, bauxite, ultis, and gold. These resources have provided frontiers for large-scale environmental destruction, which dates back to colonial times. Since the 1930s, Sierra Leone has been providing mineral resources. The question arises, why should the local church of Sierra Leone care? The intertwined link between climate change and poverty is not only a sociopolitical concern, but also a deep moral and spiritual concern for those who profess faith in God. And for us Christians, since God is not unconcerned or apathetic about the plight of humans and the world problems, we need to care. The climate change crisis is increasingly being seen as a question of social justice. At the beginning of this session, Hugh spoke about social justice as part of that vision of the church's teaching, the corpus of social teaching, which contains a rich deposit of moral principles and values. For a very lo long time now, the church has shown keen interest in promoting the cause of the poor. One of the central tenets of Catholic social teaching is the church's commitment to social justice, which demands standing in solidarity and giving voice to the concerns of the poor. 
The Catholic Church in Sierra Leone, which now comprises four dioceses, the Ash Diocese of Freetown, Diocese of Makini, the Diocese of Kenema, and my home diocese, the Diocese of Bo, has contributed greatly to the social capital development of Sierra Leone since its humble beginnings. The church plays a leading role in the education sector, healthcare provision, and other developmental programs. However, notwithstanding the pressing environmental challenges facing the country, the issue of environmental destruction and climate change is not yet on the agenda of the, of the church's list of priorities, unfortunately. Although the church leaders and theologians have long since spoken about the dangers of climate change and its impact on the poor, the pontificate of Pope Francis has provided an opportune moment for the church, that includes the Church of Sierra Leone, to address the crisis in dialogue with other spheres of human endeavor. Pope Francis, with his emphasis on the poor and the marginalized, has brought renewed attention to the social concerns of the Catholic Church. In light of the intertwined link between social and environmental poverty, Francis has made a clear call to the whole church, the entire people of God, to integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment. In his landmark 2015 encyclica on the care of our common home, the first encyclica in the history of a church to be entirely dedicated to ecological issues, Francis not only situates his discussion within the framework of justice by link linking the cry of the earth, the cry of the poor, through the overarching principle of the encyclica, Francis links respect and promotion of human rights and dignity to the care of creation. In addition to mainstreaming care for the environment as an integral part of a church's mission, Francis is also promoting decentralization of church governance, a process now being referred to as ecclesia subsidiarity. Within the framework of ecclesia subsidiarity, Pope Francis is pushing for greater authority for local churches around the world in communion with the universal church to take greater responsibility for their own pastoral concerns. In my view, the adverse effect of the climate change on the poor in Sierra Leone constitute an urgent pastoral challenge that needs to be incorporated into the pastoral priorities of the church. At all levels, Pope Francis spirited someone to listen to the twin cry of the earth and the poor, a metaphor for the pain, anguish, suffering, and lamentation of the marginalized, the weak, and the defenseless. is not grounded in some abstract theological principle, but one based on real life situation in many parts of the world, including Sierra Leone. This is evidenced by the 24th, August, 20, August 14, 2017, devastating landslide and flooding disaster in Freetown, which caused the death of hundreds of Sierra Leoneans, mostly poor people who are living in shanty towns on the hills of Freetown. And my elder brother, Vincent, who happened to have a house in that area, was one of the victims. Given its organizational structure, it is its influence and widespread membership, of which the vast majority are poor and rural dwellers, it is imperative on the local church of Sierra Leone, in dialogue with other Christian and religious traditions in the country, to be at the forefront in providing prophetic voice and leadership for tackling this climate crisis. This demands a listening to the voice of the poor themselves. I am disappointed, as Father Bernard was saying, that the poor have, the voice of the poor has not been prioritized in this COP26 in Glasgow. I'm paying host to delegates from Sierra Leone. Some of them are here. They just came back from the conference. They are having their dinner now. And they are mostly middle class and 
civil servant and parliamentarian. Not one, one person from the rural communities in Sierra Leone is here to represent them in this conference. As Pope Francis has repeatedly noted, the problem of a poor cannot be resolved without the participation of a poor. They do not need charity. They do not need philanthropic gesture from people from the global south to survive. All they want is an enabling environment to live their lives in dignity. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. That was very powerful and brings together all that we've heard earlier in the evening. Um, we've learned so much detail from all that we've heard and, and I think that that, um, that expression um, of, of what you've experienced, what your brother experienced, we're so sorry to hear that. Um, it's, it is indeed time that we hear the voice of the poor, as well as the voice of the earth. I'm now going to ask uh, Julie to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Theology and Religious Studies Department's inspiration for this series of events. And um, I think that probably you've got some comment to make about what we've, we've heard so far, the deep insights we're getting from our inspirational speakers. Um, but I would remind you all to put those questions into the chat box and then after Julie has spoken, we'll have a, a, a quick question and answer session. I think there's some interesting ones there already. Julie. How to follow those speakers appropriately. Anything I wish to say is entirely swept aside by the powerful authenticity of the voices that we've heard and we have been well I have been extremely moved but also I've learned a huge amount I thought I knew something of the extent of the situation the complex nexus of issues that are a vicious cycle each uh, making matters worse for the whole climate crisis and the effects on poor people but Today, my experience and understanding has been massively enriched. So thank you to the speakers. The inspiration for this event, how can one not be inspired by having contacts with people like, in my case, knowing Robert from his work in the Theology and Religious Studies Department at Glasgow. And it was very obvious that his research, for instance, on Laudato C, he would be an obvious person to have contributing to Catholic Voices at COP26 as people on the fringe and the sidelines and trying to give voice and publicity to the wisdom that maybe isn't going to get centre stage or on the high stage at the high tables of power uh, during COP26, but has messages that resonate powerfully and deserve to be heard widely. So it's trying to amplify and network and spread the wisdom and the voices. That was the inspiration for this event. And it's been an absolute delight to be able to get to know Marion better and to link with Pax Christi Scotland on this, because it is quite clear, of course, that conflict is being fomented at every turn on this question. I will just say one more thing because we should get some discussion going on these very important issues and that is I can put links in the chat where you can find the videos of these events. They're not up yet except the one from Sunday on the 7th, uh, Art for Earth People. There's, uh, the videos will be available on the Theology and Religious Studies YouTube channel and the Pax Christie Scotland YouTube channel. You can just Google those and find them, but I can put the links in the chat. There's another event coming up on the 11th of November, another live event. Do please hook into that. I'll again put a link where you can find out more details about the amazing speakers we've got. Don't miss it. Spread the word. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, I think we're, we're both 
kind of blown away with what we've heard this evening um, and indeed in previous events. Um, Emily, can can you help here with the, the questions that are piling into the the chat box, and we'll see if we can direct them to to the right people. Yes. Uh, by, by the way, I've just put the link to the uh, TRS Department YouTube in the chat. As Julie said, the recordings they do exist. They are going up. I've actually just been working on the first one. Uh, throughout this uh, call, so it does it does exist. It's really exciting, um, and it will be going up on there and on the Pax Christie website now. Well, the YouTube. So let's have a look at some of these questions because we've got some great ones. Um, first one from Mary McHugh: What are the Jesuits doing in their boys' school to educate boys and men? Um, I'll do a little clicking it. So, to address the structural gender discrimination and power imbalance between women and men. So, I think Father Charlie has got to answer that one. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, several responses, but I'd like to emphasize two. Uh, the first one is uh, the response that is embedded in the program that I spoke about, the Bakita Partnership. Uh, when we were actually developing it, a number of people asked that question. So the whole program will not just be focused on girls, but it will be will work in tandem and in collaboration with communities um, uh, where these schools are, are embedded uh, to work with them. You know, like you know, it, 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 communities in in terms of. Uh, you know, like parents and others in the villages, you know, like talk about these issues and how they relate to girl education or any other form of education. So there's that component in the program. And also we've just started um, a, a program to a training of trainers where we've taken all the junior schools in Africa and we are training teachers on and also working on um, uh, systems change in schools so that this is not just a topic but it's part of uh, systems change and culture change thank you thank you father charlie what i think we've got a couple for um bernard have we uh, emily yes uh a couple yeah a couple of uh, nice quick questions here so first of all what species of tree do you select for your planting? Bernard, can you can you tell us about the the type of trees that you select for planting? Okay, thank you for your question. Okay. Uh, when it comes to tree planting, it depends with the with the region where we want to plant the trees. Uh, the people in authority maybe which type of uh, trees they want to be planted in their uh, region. But um, mostly we plant uh, indigenous trees. Indigenous trees um, are types, types of trees that uh, cannot be used for maybe making timber and uh, furnitures. Um, we consider trees that um, are not at risk of being cut down. So, um, mostly we, we consider indigenous trees and uh, maybe fruit-bearing trees because it is not easy to find that uh, people are cutting down um, fruit-bearing trees. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, just another one for you there, Bernard. Uh, what inspired you to begin this work? Okay, um, so when I was uh, a teenager, I used to hear the story of Wangari Mavai, the late professor who was a Kenyan. She was the first East African woman to, to be a professor, and she was also the first East African woman to get, not even East African, an African woman to get Nobel Peace Prize. So I used to 
to hear about a story and then I got inspiration from her. That's why I started planting the trees and decided to follow our footsteps. Thank you. And, and there's a very nice um, appreciation of what you've said, Bernard. Uh, uh, it says there's a very clear evaluation of climate change and double talk from world leaders. Um, and, and that's Anne who says that she absolutely agrees with what you've said, Bernard. And we also have greetings from Zambia, from Sister Veronica, who will be with us on Thursday evening um, uh, and, and talking. So that's good to see you and, and to have you with us, Sister Veronica. What else have we got, Emily? Uh, otherwise, it's a bit more of a general one. Um, has... Sorry, so does anyone know if any African church uh, sent or financed uh, any women to be at COP? Um, I certainly don't know the answer. I don't know if anyone else does. Um, I think Father, that Father Charlie, have you heard if, of, if any African church from Africa has sent, sent in the terms of, of financing Lay uh, people or women to be at COP twenty one, COP twenty six. No, not from the former top church, both in Africa or the Vatican, <laughs> and, and I think the entire Vatican team was just men, um, priests, bishops. Um, no, although we had um, church, yeah. Women of faith, church women who, who came back from other initiatives, maybe like what um, uh, has been presented. People who do things like that, but nothing formal from the church. Good question. Okay, and and, and Father Robert, do do you have you heard of it, of anything like that? I think from what you were saying that um, no, the answer is no. Not at all. From Sierra Leone, she happens to be a Catholic, but she's here on account of the government of Sierra Leone. Right, right. Well, I think that's it's a, a pretty shocking situation, actually. But um, thank you to that. Um, we have one that's specifically for you, Robert. Um, can you say more about how ecclesial solidarity? might make a difference at the grassroots church level in Sierra Leone, which kind of follows on to that, I think. I'll start by saying uh, that the, the culture of solidarity, for instance, in those like the village of Mam, I mean, the town of Mayamba, where I was, when people have a, a crisis, let's say a funeral, for instance, or a wedding, the whole of the community come together to, to mourn or to celebrate with them. Also, uh, we have what we call faith-based, I mean, uh, community-based uh, groups of, uh, what's the word for it? It's from Latin, it's an, it's a, it was appropriated from Latin America, uh, wherein uh, the people organize themselves from their community before they bring anything to the church. So it's already very much alive. All we need to do is to harness that reality and make it uh, workable in the church. Like I said, uh, people generally do not want to depend or want the world to provide for them. All they need is for the enabling environment and solidarity is already there because it's it's part of the African DNA. You know, it's, it's not something new. Thank you. And, and have we anything else there, Emily? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, no, I think that's it for questions. There's a very nice comment, though. I think we should... Re will, I, will I read that one out? Yeah. Um, Maureen says, uh, who's from Ireland, I've been listening to these sessions and I'm so encouraged that Catholic thought is progressing and that Pope Francis has given this impetus to this development by linking us to creation 
uh, a new vision of God. So that's um, a, a really uh, encouraging um, comment to 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 have there at the end of that. We um, does anyone else have a question that they would like to add at this point? We've got a couple of minutes if you have. And, aha, uh -huh. will the Synod help the church across the world to hear the African story and connect with the African journey? Now, there's a question for, well, Father, Father Charlie, can, can you make a comment on that? Yes, um, there are a lot of initiatives, not, not me not say a lot, but there are initiatives um, to, to do that in Africa. And every conference, every diocese is, um, has begun the process of uh, this synod, consultation and all kinds of things that are already taking place. Uh, I also know of uh, another effort by um, Porticus, Porticus have uh, supported an initiative where I know uh, one of our theologians has been asked to work with bishops um, in Africa to, to ensure that this, um, this happens. And in fact, like I mentioned, we also taking advantage of, um, the, the, like, see that's the opportunity for Francis's offering. He's really been emphasizing listening, listening, listening. And so there are deliberate efforts by Rome to consult with bishops from Africa. In fact, I've participated in some processes where uh, Rome uh, engages bishops in Africa, like listening to them. Uh, that's very, very encouraging coming uh, from uh, Pope Francis. And we are hopeful that this will be a good uh, process. Thank you. Father Robert, have you anything to add to that? In addition to, to listening, uh, Francis is also encouraging uh, uh, Frank speaking, you know, where people are not afraid to, to express themselves. Uh, prior to Francis, when synods were had, uh, bishops from Africa were intimidated. You know, they were not encouraged to speak their mind. But now he's saying that, I can't remember the exact Greek word he used, but he's encouraging bishops to speak their mind. Because speaking, listening and speaking is part of uh, promoting what, what he has called ecclesia subsidiarity, wherein people, especially the periphery, can speak to the center instead of the center always speaking to the periphery. And, and those bishops from Africa, they bring perspective of their people, but sometimes they are intimidated. They are not allowed to speak their mind. And so in addition to listening, there's also honest speaking. Yeah, because that's what we're being encouraged to do is to reach out to the marginalized and bring them into this um, process. So I do hope that that happens in Africa as well. Um, please go on pushing for that, that the marginal, marginalized voices are heard. Um, I think, uh, Emily, I think we're, we're kind of at the bottom of that. Um, we have a comment from Anne, I am so impressed and encouraged by your active discipleship for all of your contrib contributors, but we need to make sure that women's voices are heard and represented. And I would be, I'm going to ask Father Charlie to comment on that because he was talking about um, women and girls, but Bernard, you have emphasized um, football games and so on. Are, are the girls involved in your project, Bernard? Okay, thank you for, for the question. What I can say is that a uh, larger number of the kids that we have, uh, it is the boy child. We don't have girls in our program, but um, in the near future, we shall be incorporating uh, girls in our um, program. But uh, one challenge we face is that um, we don't have uh, enough resources to run uh, our projects. 
because um, we had a program we used to call it um, football for nature and um she incorporated around 200 young boys but uh, due to resources it ran for only one year and then it collapsed then uh, we decided to reduce the number of kids uh, under our program so in the near future if we uh, we get uh, uh, enough resources to run our project we will incorporate both boys and girls because as you know a uh, girl child needs uh, a lot of care yeah thank you okay it's so if anybody out there has a source of funding that they can direct in bernard's direction then i think that's absolutely necessary um father charlie could you make one last comment on um that need for women's voices to be heard and represented um uh yeah there are some positive uh, developments but more needs to be done more needs to be to be done but what is encouraging is that um, there's leadership uh Uh, around that uh, both in africa as well as uh, at the vatican and first of all starting with the vatican i mean i've been working on this covid-19 commission uh we've seen uh for the first time women are taking a position in the vatican on some of the issues um that i mean we've never seen that before um the vatican was just men and priests uh but things are changing a lot uh, especially in the diaspora for integral for the promotion of integral uh human development in fact the assistant to the cardinal now is a sister uh, a religious sister yeah um so that, that and uh, yeah they are talking of her as the most powerful woman in the vatican at the moment but that's encouraging um and we we need to see more of that uh in africa we need to see something like that uh also in the ecclesial circles uh, leadership places in uh, in africa um uh it hasn't yet begun to happen but uh, there's there's movement toward that and one program actually that we are working on is uh to develop more wi- more women theologians especially the the sisters who are just you know taken to be or these are preschool teachers but now you get more and more sisters training up to that um you know with high degrees phd's in theology or in other fields and are having a place uh in the church in fact there's a our our advertiser is a webinar coming up on synodality and one of the women theologian will be speaking I'll, I'll share that Thank you. Father Robert, have you anything to, to add to that? I think there are many of us here this evening who would say that we have the same feeling about women uh in the northern hemisphere, let alone uh in Africa, but um uh, are are you do you have anything to add to to that situation? Uh it is in in Kenya and other places uh, the, the voice of women are very muted uh, largely uh, due to patriarchy and also i think this uh, the discussion on on environmental issues should integrate questions on on gender on gender issues because uh, they 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 be at the brunt of the uh, of, of the crisis in, for instance in 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 Sierra Leone the the farm the, the farming Uh, system there are women do the the large portion of the work you know they even though they they do not benefit so much from from the resources accrued but they they suffer a lot and also in, within the church uh, women women have been largely marginalized i don't think there's much women representation at the parish level yes they they are they are, they, are, they contribute gr- greatly to promoting the the welfare of uh, Uh, of of uh, priests and and other religious but i think it has to move away just from them providing resources you know to ha- listening to their voice 
I think that that's um, that's a, a prayer for us all. I think we're we're just Bernard about... wants to speak. I think sorry? Bernard has. A, I think Bernard wants to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. Bernard. Okay, uh, I needed to ask uh, something. Uh, most of us in this meeting, you have seen that uh, you have uh, education programs. So my question is, how can uh, the boys and our program be uh, incorporated in those education programs? Because most of them that we have are under um, the age of uh, 15 years. And in a few years, they will be joining high school or uh, they will be clearing high school. So how can we incorporate them in that uh, education program so that we may support them academically? Um, that's a question I think that has to go to perhaps Father Charlie or Father Robert. Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, and I, I think I, I think you're not the first one to ask when we develop the program. That question has been coming up uh, several times. Um, and so uh, at the moment, uh, at the moment, no, but um, because of the evaluations we have received and recommendations, uh, we, we will certainly um, do that because, I mean, there's thinking that unless the boys also are taken care of in that sense, um, we won't be able to, to sort out the problem. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question, and you're not the first one. A number of people have asked uh, similar questions because you may tend to over empower one group. Uh, you know, you know when you react too much um, um, in favor of one group. So um, it, it, it's something that we'll consider. Yeah. Well, we, for once, we, we seem to be right on time. Um, thank you, Emily, for helping with the, the, the chat box there. Um, thank you to Julie. And, uh, yeah, there have been some such powerful speakers, but such powerful questions as well. So could I thank Father Charlie Chalufia, Bernard and Daka, and Father Robert Soa for such inspirational contributions to this evening's, this today's event. Um, thank you to Hugh Foy for guiding us in prayer and reflection. Um, again, Emily, I can't uh, thank you enough for your technical expertise. And uh, Julie and I would like to thank you all for joining us this, to this event. Don't miss out on the rest. Sister Veronica, who is here with us, um, will be speaking with others on Thursday evening. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll see all of the details on Eventbrite if you go back to that mm -hmm. uh, link. And the links are all the same. So um, we are learning how we can care for our common home. Um, peace be with you wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. And good night. Take care, everyone. Good night.